What lessons can we take from therapists to do better in our own lives? That's what we'll talk about today. The attempt to escape from pain is what creates more pain. Gabor Mate. Today we're going to talk about the book from Owen O'Kane, How to Be Your Own Therapist. Now, I'm not a therapist. He is a therapist. But I think that there is a place before you need therapy that maybe you can help yourself a bit. If you need therapy, if you need someone professionally to talk about who can give you an outside perspective, I fully endorse it. But up to that point, maybe there are things that we can do in order to make our lives a little bit happier and to go over the influences that create our moods, change our well-being, our outlook in life. And so we're going to talk about that book. As a therapist, he wondered how he can help more people. There's a lot of people who just won't go to therapists or can't afford therapists or maybe aren't at that point where they need therapy. And so he wondered, is there a place where I can help people finish up? So he decided to write a book of skills, some ways that you can look at your life to help yourself be better. And again, he's a therapist. He's not saying anything bad about it, but he does think that there are valuable ideas and skills that he uses that can help almost anybody. He says that too many self-help books and those kinds of things promise that you can change your life. And he does believe we can change our life, but a lot of times the pieces of advice we get from other books might not help us to change our lives in significant ways. He says that we have to know our deep story, our real story, he says, and how it makes sense in our lives, how it tells a story to us now and what we can get from it. What can we learn from it to help us progress? And then can we take those ingredients of pieces and have a contented life? He says that it's real story of your life is not just, well, I grew up here and I grew up there and I played in the snow, but instead it is sharing and bringing out key events in your life and in chronological order, because I think that makes sense. If you hit a stressful point in your life and it happened after five years when something really awful happened, your reaction in that event probably happened because of your reaction in the first event. So having it in order will help you. And so he always says that there's ways we can drag that story out. He hopes that, you know, for about four minutes a day at the beginning of the day, try to think about calming your brain down. Whatever inside chatter, oh, today's going to be terrible or, oh, today's going to be the best day of my life. But instead, get your brain into a place where it's ready for whatever adventure follows you next. And then he says later in the day, he calls it after lunch, you can then start managing any setbacks you had during the day, put them in perspective, think about how to properly react, not emotionally react. So your boss yells at you and you immediately react angry, you're upset. But now that you've had some lunch, you had a little chance to process, start processing your day in a more hmm, meaningful or useful way. And then he says before bed, you just want to go to bed, rest, reflect on the day a little bit. I would warn you about reflecting on anything upsetting at the end of your day because it could prevent you from falling asleep. But, you know, think about some of the main high points and, you know, that's it. You're ready to go. You're supposed to sleep. You're not supposed to think about anything else. You know, I'm that person who wakes up at three in the morning going, you know what I should do? I should do a podcast about boxes. That sounds like a great idea. And why am I thinking of this at three in the morning? I don't know. Rest. Rest is the main goal of your nighttime and not sorting out your brain so that you can wake up in the middle of the night and do other things. He says, too, that if you are overwhelmed, if you are feeling strong emotions, if you're depressed, if you're not having people around you who can help you, that's the time that you may want to seek professional help. Someone who, like I said, bounce ideas off of, talk to someone else. I think it's great in some way to have third-party people who are not so invested in your life on a day-to-day basis. Someone who's a little outside the world and therapists can be for that. Not only that, they have the ability to help you if you are under the influence of something else like alcohol, drugs, and addiction, something like that. And so they have some other techniques available to them. But in this case, we're talking about levels where you don't need to go. And what he says is that therapy 
helps your brain put everything in the right bucket. It helps you respond to negative experiences. It helps you see the bigger impact something may have in your life. And in some cases, some people are very good at adjusting, putting it in perspective, and other people, it harms them quite a bit. They suffer and, you know, it drags them down. So a lot of life, he says, is happening because of what we encountered in our childhood. And he says that that is probably what is causing us a lot of angst and emotion that's negative right now. He says, unfortunately, our emotions are a lot like weather where it fluctuates between two extremes. It's really cold. And it's really hot. And it can do that in a short period of time instead of being at a steady state. Some of that hot and coldness has to do with how you're made up chemically and it has something to do with your experience. But our brain is meant to be reactive, right? You're cooking your dinner, you're enjoying your time with your family, but now there's a tiger outside your cave and you have to go chase the tiger down. It is meant to be switching on a dime so that you're protected against whatever comes up next. But now it probably is a little too overreactive, too critical, too quick to react. And so that's where he says that instead of having these automatic emotional responses to things, you know, your mom comes over, she yells at you, you feel terrible, you yell at her, and now it's this automatic pathway that you've built up for each other. Instead, we may want to figure out how we can maybe not think so automatically, not automatically think we're terrible and not automatically think that person is terrible or whatever reaction you have. So he says that if your rule is perfectionism, is that you must be successful, is that you have to please everyone around you, you know, that's it. Humans, that's the way we are. And so that will be our challenge, he says. We will be challenged all the time with these ideas, these mindsets that will cause us a lot of negativity in our future. But he says if we can be more flexible, if we can approach our lives, tackle those rules we have, I have to please everybody or I can never show emotion. I have to be stoic. If we can tackle those, maybe our lives play out a little bit differently. We react to things indifferently. And we're able to manage some of our perfectionism, maybe have a little bit of kindness for ourselves the next time these things happen. So by reviewing, he says, and then adapting and creating flexibility in our brain, we'll be able to tackle those things a little bit better. So he says the top of the cake is the emotions. The second layer are the rules that we create for ourselves. And then the third layer is the influences of everything around us the core of our beliefs, the center of whatever it is we believe to be true in our lives. And so he said, that's what therapy really goes after, these core beliefs. And then hopefully once you do that, you'll be able to then direct your emotions better. You'll be able to react better and you'll control your thoughts and emotions better. And then eventually you'll be able to live a more successful, I guess, happy life. He says that there are some main categories to this. There's the concept of security. We either think that we are secure, we're safe in our environments, or we believe that we are not. As a kid, I believed that I was not safe. I believed that I had no security of having a meal the next day or having a house the next day or anything like that. And so now I can see that it causes me to want to put everything in its proper place in my life so that I have that feeling of security and I feel that one day is going to be reliable the next day too. Lovability, he says, that means are we lovable or are we not lovable? That's an important piece. Self-worth, you know, do we have value? Do we have skills and things that we're good at? Do we have places that we can bring the world value, the people around us value and ourselves value? And then there's hope. He says we either feel hopeful or we feel hopeless. And so those main categories in our lives control what it is we think and feel for the rest of it. He says that we have some strategies that will help us in matter of reflecting on our lives, taking action after that, journaling, writing things down, challenging any type of patterns and thoughts you have. If you're a perfectionist, maybe it's time to challenge that a little bit so that you can move on and start getting things done. or. 
Maybe if you think, man, I'm just a slob. That's just who I am. Nothing ever is right. Nothing's ever perfect. Maybe that needs to get challenged too. And then the next part is to be regulating how we react and how our emotions are inside. I told you that early on in my life, I learned that lesson that someone can push your buttons. You don't have to react to them. And if you don't get to that place where people stop pressing any buttons because you're not letting them, you're going to be responsive all the time to other people. And then the last part is accepting things that might be hard to hear. You've probably tried to compartmentalize everything into cute little packages. And sometimes the hard part is actually sitting down and listening to those hard things and coming up with strategies with them. I know for me, you could go through this thing about, oh, it was my upbringing that led to my overweightness. Or I constantly wanted to drive into books because it was my way of escaping my life, which means you're not exercising or getting out there in nature because you're in a book. But instead, maybe the hard truth is I'm not doing enough to change my situation. That's the hard truth. How can we bring that out so we can have reactions to it? Because if we don't listen to those hard truths, or we'll never get to the nut of what is causing us to never get our goals, to never move past certain things. And so he said that we want to know that we're the solution. No one can fix us. A therapist is great for driving out ideas against prescribing drugs if you need to have medication, helping with really nasty things like addictions. But in the end, you're going to be the solution to your problems. If you never get to that point, you'll never be able to help it. I remember listening to Alnon, and they say a person could want to get out of addiction all the time. They understand it's destroying their lives, it's destroying their family lives. It just can never get there. And until they call it rock bottom, the person realizes they have nowhere else to go, meaning that they never get to the part where they realize they're the only solution to getting out of this. He says people deny it, they minimize the problem, or they catastrophize it. Well, I'm just going to be a horrible person for the rest of my life and I'm never going to get a good job. Oh, that's a little bit awful, don't you think? Or people who constantly ruminate constantly think about the problems or disassociate themselves from their problems. Well, that was my dad's issue, not my issue. It doesn't have anything to do with me. Well, I grew up in the family where my dad was drinking too much. Of course, it has something to do with me, not the cause of it, but it's also something that I can't just disassociate from my life. Avoidance, fantasizing that it never happened. Sometimes I saw that people who had hard childhoods try to pretend it never happened or it didn't happen to them, or it was beautiful and wonderful. And then suddenly, once you get to talk to them for a little bit, you find out it wasn't quite so wonderful. And then repressing. It means that you're going to focus. I'm, you know, I am focused on my future. My past doesn't matter. And so he says in that sense, the past does matter because it is causing us to believe, feel, react in certain ways. And until we drive that out, we might never get to just solving it instead of ignoring it or repressing it. So he says that what you'll do is you'll write the story of your life in chronological order. You'll then do a second rewrite, which might be a deeper dive, maybe thinking about it a little bit more. And then is that if you can, that you want to share your story with someone else. I mean, I think it draws you closer to someone else so they understand you, but it also... As you're talking, and I know this from being a podcaster, once you start saying something, suddenly you're like, oh, yeah, that's really interesting. I can tell you that this podcast is probably as helpful to me as anybody because hearing me explain something in a way makes me realize that maybe that had a little bit more impact than I'm giving it credit for. It is helpful to talk to someone about these things. He breaks it up into categories of ages 0 to 9, 10 to 19. 20 to 29, 30 to 40, and you get it. You're going to put down what experiences you had in those buckets and then what was the end meaning for it. Like I said, I can just sit there and say, oh, yeah, my dad, he was never around. He never came through for us. If I had a swim meet, half the times he wouldn't even show, you know, and I can gloss over it all I want. But what in the end did that do to me to think that people were unreliable? They were never going to be on my side. And then the second now I see 
people being unreliable to me. I'm like, yeah, that's the way it goes. I can't trust anybody. Ooh, now we got something. We're going to go through those lists. He says whether they're happy, they're sad, and we're going to list those things out. He says the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to list out all the happy things, the exciting things, the things that we celebrated in our lives. And then we're going to look at some of the negative memories, break those out too. And those might be anything from losing a job or losing a person and having regrets. And he says it's fine that if you feel uncomfortable, it doesn't feel great to drag all these things out of your system. And so then while you're dragging it out, he says what matters is not what other people considered it. What matters is what it meant to you whether you have siblings who had the same experience, who might be reacting to the same experiences you had in an entirely different way. Or in my case, I'd go to my grandmother and say, grandmother, this is what is happening in my house. And she'd say, well, you should be stronger than that. Just realize that you can move on, that this is only a short period of time. You know, and she did dismiss it and it did give me a good perspective and a good way of dealing with it. But then again, it also made me Decide that it didn't matter, and maybe it does matter. So this is where he said, it's important what you think, what your struggles are, and what is the brutal, honest truth with you, instead of what other people are telling you, anything like that. And like I said at the end, he says that if you can share it with someone, he calls them a PAL, which stands for present, accepting, and loving. Someone who will be on your side, who can listen to your story. And Sometimes, again, outside people have such a good perspective on it. You know, it sounds to me like you always worried about security in your life. It's probably why you're so addicted to it right now. And then you're like, oh, wow, that's insightful. I didn't think about that. And you get that too. You read a book and you're able to see in the book what's happening and what's going to happen. But a lot of times when people listen to our story, they have some insights like that as well. When we share stories and we feel like, they were harmful to us or they're hard stories. It destroys our self-worth. We don't feel safe and secure. That, like I said, was some realization I had. Again, you might feel unloved or that you don't have hope. Those are those four categories again. And he said that you might encounter people who feel hopeless. And he said nobody picks that from themselves. Hopelessness is something because it came out of an event. It came out of life event. And he says, all of us have the ability to have hope. If you can't find hopelessness, he wants you to go through the exercises in this book. But I also think it might be the clue to you that it's time for therapy because everybody can have hope. But consider where you are on your level of hope. He says that initially what we'll do is that we're going to just acknowledge when we go back and we look at our story and we reflect on our feelings, we're just going to say, oh, yeah. I felt really sad that this happened or that happened. I remember one situation where I had saved a lot of money. I worked really hard babysitting and doing a number of jobs, and I saved about $3,000, which when we moved from the military base into civilian life, my father said, I'm going to take that money. We're going to take it out of the bank, and then I will give it back to you when we get a new bank in the new town. You're going to know I never saw that money again. And then he asked me what I wanted to do with the money. And I'm like, I don't know. I want to buy a radio. So he bought me a radio. And that was the only part of the money I saw, a $50 radio for about $3,000 worth of worth. Now I can say, whatever, it's over with. But maybe that was why I had a lot of problems with money. But I'm just going to initially acknowledge, okay, that sucked. That was terrible. It made me lack trust in having maybe parents or a savings account. I never saw, you know, and we're just going to say that it happened. We're going to acknowledge it. Then we're going to look at our behaviors as a reaction to that. That was the next step. Could make me have bad money attitudes later in life. And that's probably why I never got to the place where I could save again until just recently. It was a lifetime of mistrusting savings. Well, you might try to save money, but in the end, you're just going to lose it anyway. So why bother? Just spend it and have fun. And then he says you want to connect it to whatever struggles you're having in your day-to-day -day lives. And so you'll go through all of those events doing that kind of an exercise. But he wants us to look at it and see, are we happy right now? Are we happy with our work, our social lives, 
our romantic lives, our relationship with God and our families? And are we okay with our self-image? Do we feel good about ourselves? And then our values and principles. Are we a person who has morals? Are we a person who has set values? And then all that leads then to the part where are we looking after ourselves physically? Are we looking after ourselves emotionally? Do we go out and eat the right things and have exercise? So he says that he breaks that all down into three areas, our material life and what we want to be for the future. Then our internal life, the way we think, and again, the emotions that we have with those. So we want to know now how we are right now with our things, our material life, with our internal life, and our goals and aspirations. Do we have anything? Do we have any plans? And do we want to go back and take a look? He says at our list again to see if, if we have our needs cared for, if we have our wishes cared for, as long as he said, you got to watch out because maybe your wishes are to please people or to have perfection. If those are the cases. And that's where we're going to go back to step one and sort of realize we can't control those things. And then he wants us to know, do we have a sense of hope? Are we satisfied? Do we feel like our goals are going in the direction we want to go? And in the end, are we happy? He says that we have to do these types of exercise, our commitment to the self-therapy on a daily basis. It's not something we're going to forget about for a while and come back to it. We're working to change our patterns and our thoughts and our emotions and the things that drive us into the ditch and rewire our brain, which means we're going to have to be vigilant. Anytime we find ourselves driving ourselves into the brain, or maybe for me, I find myself having a blase view of money. Oh, well, it's just money, whatever. No, no, no. <laughs> having a safety net is important to you feeling secure. Maybe I'm using one type of a image I got from my childhood against another. But he says that we want to be committed to this. And we also want to have patience. This is going to take time. You're going to wonder why it's not working or why you don't feel better or I'm going to do it later. All the different excuses. He gives a list of excuses or maybe even the worst of them. I can't be helped. I'm someone who can't be helped. I can't move forward and get away from those negativity pieces. Have a little patience, have a little grace with yourself. And once you do that, you'll become Willing to go forward. I, I think about that in terms of yet. I use that yet statement. We talked about like you say, oh, I'm not good at driving yet. You put the yet at these sentences. And I found myself saying something like, oh, I'm just not very good at this. And then I remembered yet. So that might be how you can get out of those traps. But giving yourself that grace so that you have time to move on. This type of change takes time. So my challenge to you is start off with his story capturing. Can you write down those key events that happened to you in every decade from zero to nine, 10 to 19, and so on? What are some main events that happened to you in this time? And write down what were the resulting attitudes that you had? What resulting messages did you get that are still present in your life today? If you're interested, you can buy this book and go through all the exercises that he gives in order to get that clarity on your past and how it's impacting your future. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember I have another podcast, which is Small Steps with God. Both of them are very similar in that they cover a book or a topic and then have a challenge at the very end. Also keep in mind that one of the things I use, again, I just got to be an affiliate for Notion, is Notion. I use it as my notebook, as my place that I document everything. This podcast, my savings account, everything goes in it. And so it's a one-stop place for everything I need to do. It can be as easy as creating Word documents out of it, in a sense, or more complex that you can actually make databases, connect them together, create to-do lists, all those things. So consider clicking on the links in the show notes for those affiliate listings. And remember, our path to Putting our past in perspective starts with small steps.